Yes, ma'am. You have presented to us a historical feast. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Although you explain to a certain extent what travelers or immigrants or so-called returnees have contributed, do you think more emphasis should be put on the struggle and triumph of the African people in the diaspora who have traveled because of necessity and yet what they have contributed to the country? Do you think more should be put into that? Well, I've certainly put a lot of emphasis in my book on yes. that. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by more emphasis. And no, in terms, of, in terms of always we are um, more or less talking about our difficulties. Uh -huh. But the point that you have made and what I'm trying to bring forth is to, regardless of the difficulties, the uniqueness of these travelers that they have survived yes. and still contribute so much, yes. which no, you I'm, have done, but I'm yes. just saying in your opinion, do you think more studies should be done on that? Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I, I agree with you that um, this is a positive side of our nationhood that we really should celebrate. The, you know, the, the fact that people are willing to travel and do what it takes to, to make a living. I mean, it's just part of who we are, you know? So yes, I agree with you. Thanks for a really wonderful lecture. Uh, one quick question. How much of this has been documented on the other side and is it part of their curriculum? You mean in Panama? I'm not, I don't know, but um, you know, the interest there has, I think in, in this, the descendants of the so-called silver workers is quite recent and is growing. And so I think what we're gonna be seeing is a lot more uh, development in Panama itself, as in the West Indies, of um, our recognition of the significance of these migrations to Panama and what they meant to both countries. But I'm really not up on you know, what's going on in Panama. Perhaps, I don't know if the charge is able to help us there. <laughs> no, okay. No, um, good afternoon. Uh, congratulations, you, hearty Marie. congratulations. Uh, just to corroborate some of the points that you have made, um, my maternal great aunts uh, left from Barbados, uh, about three of them, uh, and went to Panama, uh, one would bring out the other and so on. Um, one became a nurse and got married in Panama, had children there and so on. Uh, the, the other two, well that one returned to Barbados, but the other two left from Panama and went to the US, to New York, at different times and must have been involved in service work of some kind. They, I don't really know what work they did there. And then after many years came back to Barbados where they eventually died. And um, uh, just to say that, you know, the, in terms of the, the movement up and down the hemisphere that was going on, there, I have evidence from the US, um, Ellis Island records of the arrival of these aunts in, in New York. And some of them came, uh, came on boats that were coming from Brazil, stopping at Barbados, going to Panama, and then going up to the States. So they, they, you know, people were sort of hopping from one place to the other. And then when the, can, uh, the canal was finished, being built, uh, several of, of these Barbadians went to Ecuador, mm -hmm. as you have mentioned. I, it was only very recently that I realized that mm -hmm. there were colonies of West Indians in places like Panama. And I think there's someone at the Cave Hill campus, Dr. Marcia Burroughs. She's doing, she's doing research on a number of uh, Barbadian migrants, both to the UK and also this South American mm -hmm. thing. And um, Elombe Motley, who I thought would be here today, I think he has uh, relatives also who left from Barbados and went to Panama, then on to Ecuador. Yeah. So that, you know, there has been quite a bit of movement. 
and I think Rupert, Rupert's um, paternal grandfather left from here in Jamaica and went to Costa Rica. I, I don't know if he went through Panama at any stage, but he was in Panama for a time. That whole Port Limon yeah, um, thing. Was, yeah, the yes. Costa Rican migration was huge. Too, yes, right? yes. So ju just to yeah, thanks, corroborate. Yeah. I know, you know, it was, like, it was so much easier to travel in, in the past. You didn't need any documents in a way. <laughs> you didn't have to go and line up for a visa anywhere. You know? <laughs> So, so people just jumped on boats. But what one of, in, in a separate research that I was doing, I was amazed. To, well, we all know Bar, um, people from Barbados were in the Congo, in, in Leopold's Congo during the rubber boom there. And they were also in the Putumayo during the, the rubber boom there. You know, and, and West Indians were all over the place. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't go into any great, great detail with this, but I do have some figures. And it's um, these are the remittances and also, because the, the problem with the figures, the official figures, is that a lot of it was not recorded. All that was recorded was what you sent back officially or you declared when you arrived. So it's hard to tell. But um, in, in all of these West Indian islands, yes, this is what kept, kept, kept them afloat. And um, so I do have some figures, but I didn't systematically go through mm -hmm. because, in fact, the record the record keeping wasn't wasn't that great. But I know, for for example, when um, people went to Cuba, which was later than this was in the twenties, um, the Royal was it Royal Bank of Canada, one of the Canadian banks, had to hire five extra staff just to mm -hmm. deal with remittances from Cuba. So that gives you an idea. It was it was enormous. Um, you know, and what was also enormous was money that was gained from exports, from you know, and, and that money was didn't just go to the big man; it trickled down to all the small people involved, you know, in growing yam or raising mules or whatever. So the impact throughout was really, really considerable. Mm. Uh, well, Olive, you know, I'm going to ask a personal question. No. <laughs> Since we met at the Daily Gleena, where you were a sub-editor and I was a trainee reporter, and you terrified us, right? <laughs> it was Mirth Core, Mirth Swear, uh, Martin Mordecai, and myself. But anyway, 20 years ago, you told me you were going to write about Panama. And I waited, <laughs> and waited. And my question is, why did you choose Panama? This is, a pro this is when, when people know your personal history, you know. It's, <laughs> it's embarrassing. Um, I, well, I chose Panama because I grew up in a household of people who went to Panama. My, my great uncle, my grandfather had gone, but I didn't know anything. So I grew up with all these pictures and people talking about it. So it was imprinted in my mind from my earliest years, you know, Panama, colored CZ on letters. I didn't know it meant Canal Zone, RDP, Republic of, you know. Um, but I think it just stayed in my mind, all these images and so on. And so at some point in my life, in the 1970s actually, I said, you know, what did people do there? Why did they go to Panama? What happened? So I went to find out. You know, I, I started my research in the, um, the library in what was then the Canal Zone. and. Then I went into the archives and so on. So I did the research for the book a long time ago and um, actually wrote a draft, 
which I'm glad didn't get published because I'd like to think I'm a better writer now than I was <laughs> then, you know. Um, but I didn't get the book published. I didn't try very hard, and then life intervened. You know, I did 14 other books in the meantime. So, but then, um, I don't know if some of you remember a guy named Tony Russell, who used to be the photographer here at the Institute of Jamaica. And he, Tony Russell has been nagging me for years. Every now and then I get a little message. What happened to the Panama book? And finally, he was the one who said to me, you know, in two years' time, it's gonna be the centenary of the opening of the Panama Canal, so you better get the book done. So I, that's when I tackled it again. You know, I went back to it and started to write it because I did want to have it out in time for the centenary, and I really, really want to thank the University of the West Indies Press um, for bringing the book out in, in the time period. It's, it was a huge job. It has 200 and something pictures, but not only bringing the book out, but producing exactly what I wanted. Such a beautiful book, and I really want to thank this wonderful press that we have here. Miss Senior, thank you so much. I ha have been sitting there smiling as you talked about the men who went, and of course, the, you know, it touched my heart. The one, two, three, four, Colin Manacom, etc. And then I thought that you mentioned women, um, that women went and the various things they went to do, including, I like how you put it, what was it again? There was service, sexual um, service. Sexual service That's women. what it's now and, called, and yes. I like the phrase. <laughs> and um, a song came to my mind. Um, what a walkless dry girl like Fanny. What a walkless dry girl like Fanny. You don't get to what kind of Fanny did. Fanny left her picnic gun a Panama. Fanny left her picnic gun a Panama. What a walkless dry girl. What a walkless dry girl. What a walkless dry girl like Fanny. <laughs> Thank you for that, because I tried to find all the songs related to Panama. I quote most of them in my book. I missed that one. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, my question really relates to the future. We have been talking about the past. I just want to share a very quick example of the challenge we have. I have been editing a book called that time in foreign. Um, it was a presentation at UWI by various people who had lived overseas. So I was talking to a 20-year-old and a 19-year-old. So I saw that they seemed quite perplexed. So then I said, they asked, were these people deported? <laughs> so I think we have a larger problem that says, there's all of this knowledge of the past, some of which is not widely known. There is an abysmal ignorance of many people about what is happening in their own families. And those are some of the kinds of things that weaken the, the country's capacity to know itself and its resilience and so on. How do we get this knowledge to this next generation? Some people say they're not interested, but I don't believe that. I think it's just that we have been failing to find the ways of, of bringing this knowledge forward. It's no point that, I mean, I'm now 60, really, you know, <laughs> that um, the 16-year-olds and the 12-year-olds and the 20-year-olds don't know. How are we going to break through this um, barrier? Thank you again.